Hi, and welcome back to Mr. Raymond's Civic COC Academy, where today we are going to be looking at amendments to the U.S. Constitution that have extended voting rights for Americans. So last time we learned about the Bill of Rights, which are the first 10 amendments added to the Constitution in one document just two years after its ratification. And if you haven't already checked out that video, make sure you go back and see which rights are listed in the Bill of Rights. But today the amendments we are going to examine are among the 17 amendments that have been added to the Constitution over the past 200 years. And an amendment is just that. It's an addition or a change to the Constitution. And as this slide suggests, this allows the Constitution to change with the times. It's part of why we call the Constitution a living, breathing document. It's flexible, it can transform to match the changes that are taking place in America. As our benchmark explains, we're going to be looking at the impact of the 13th, 14th, 15th, 19th, 24th, and 26th Amendment, and how they extended the participation of minority groups in the American political process. In other words, how did these amendments give more Americans the right to vote? In addition, we're going to take a quick look at how amendments are created. Okay, so there are two parts to creating an amendment. The first part is proposing the amendment, and this is done by a two-thirds vote of both houses of Congress. Now, technically, the states can propose amendments via state conventions, but this has only happened once in U.S. history with the 21st Amendment, which legalized alcohol or really repealed the 18th Amendment, which made alcohol illegal. Yes, that's right. Alcohol became illegal during the 1920s, which which actually made more people drink and start more bars called speakeasies, as well as create mafia organizations like Al Capone. But these two amendments aren't on our test. Just remember that technically state conventions can propose amendments, but almost all amendments are started by a two-thirds vote of Congress. Now the second part of the amendment process is to be sent to the states for ratification, where either state legislatures or state conventions must vote by a three-fourths majority to ratify or approve the amendment. So for your state exam, let's keep it simple. Two-thirds of the Congress, three-fourths of the states. That's how you make an amendment so great. Yes, this is a really lame rhyme that I make my students repeat over and over. And that's it for this benchmark of how to make amendments. Remember, two-thirds of the Congress, three-fourths of the states. That's how you make an amendment so great. Yeah, that's really pretty lame. Okay, so the first three amendments that you need to know are what we call the Civil War Amendments. Now, why do we call them that? Well, all three were passed within five years of the end of the Civil War, from 1865 to 1870, in response to the slavery question. And if you consider that the first two amendments passed after the Bill of Rights were the only ones in 75 years, and the one after these three was 43 years later, it's really kind of a big deal that three were passed in concession within five years. Okay, so let's start with the 13th Amendment, obviously, which abolished slavery, the ugliest stain on the history of America, slavery. Unfortunately, it took 80 years to get rid of it. So the 13th Amendment was one that took way too long to implement. There's a great movie called Lincoln that everyone should see, which is all about Abraham Lincoln's role in getting this amendment passed. Of course, it took America's bloodiest war, in which 600,000 Americans died fighting each other to make this a reality. Yes, I'm talking about the Civil War. And I would highly recommend you spend some time studying this remarkable period in our history. But for our test, remember, lucky number 13th Amendment was lucky for our country and for the newly freed slaves. Now, because 4 million ex-slaves were now free after 1865, the question was, what rights do they have? 
In a previous video, we discussed the Dred Scott Supreme Court case three years before the war broke out, which stated that African Americans were not citizens. So the question was unsettled. What were these newly freed slaves? Well, the 14th Amendment solved that problem, and it did much more than that, by the way. Let's start by reading the text of this incredible amendment, definitely my favorite, and this is good practice for you because your state exam is going to definitely make you read original texts, many of them from these documents. So focus and see if you can pick out the rights. The 14th Amendment states in section one that, quote, all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. So the first part of the amendment defines who citizens are as, quote, all persons born or naturalized in the U.S. Now, most of you who watched our video on citizenship know that naturalization is the process of becoming a U.S. citizen. For the newly freed slaves, none of them had been naturalized. However, they had almost all been born in the United States because the importation of slaves, which brought slaves from Africa to America, had ended in 1808. So this was 60 years later, and it would have been very rare for a slave to have lived that long. Now, this rule that all persons born in the U.S. are citizens is still an issue today, especially with illegal immigrants who aren't citizens but give birth to citizens. Some right-wing Republicans have talked about getting rid of this clause, but that doesn't seem likely to ever happen. Again, you remember this as law of soil. If you are born on U.S. soil, you are a citizen, thanks to the 14th Amendment. The next protection this amendment gives is the statement that, quote, no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States. And this was kind of another dig at southern states who passed extremely racist laws known as the Black Codes. The Bill of Rights before this amendment and the Constitution was only protection from the federal or national government. But now, thanks to the 14th Amendment, the Bill of Rights, the Constitution, all the amendments are protection from state governments as well. Unfortunately, for a long time, this section of the amendment was ignored by southern states, who went on to pass what were known as Jim Crow laws, which basically segregated just about everything between blacks and whites, as well as passing a wide variety of laws designed to stop blacks from voting, such as literacy tests, poll taxes, grandfather clauses, and this would last in the South until the Civil Rights Movement and the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965, as well as the 24th Amendment, which we'll cover in a minute. But for your exam, you need to remember that the 14th Amendment changed rights as not just protections from the national government, but from state governments as well. In other words, the 14th Amendment says that state law laws must be constitutional. Now, the most powerful statement of the 14th Amendment is the declaration that no state shall deny to any person equal protection under the law. And this statement declared once and for all that all citizens of the nation must be treated equally. Well, sort of. These words continue to influence groups of persons who feel that they are being treated unfairly, and these words are often the basis of lawsuits that make their way to the Supreme Court of the United States, three of which from this list we will be learning about in an upcoming video. For now, just remember these powerful words the 14th Amendment provides equal protection under the law. And if you're not being treated equally, well, you can sue under the 14th Amendment. Okay, the 15th Amendment, the final of the Civil War Amendments, provided voting rights to African American men. It says that, quote, the right to vote shall not be denied on account of race, color, 
or previous condition of servitude. And this was a huge step forward for the newly freed slaves. We saw African American men serving in Congress and state legislatures and local governmental positions. Remember, slaves made up the majority of the population in states like Mississippi and South Carolina, and now they could vote for whoever was gonna help them. Unfortunately, this victory would be short-lived, and by the 1890s, all of those political gains that African Americans had made would be taken away by those Jim Crow, those racist voter discriminatory practices passed to deny them the right to vote. Now, although the vote should have been available to all men with the passage of the 15th, there's still a major portion of the population who couldn't vote. Do you catch who it is? Yes, women. It was women. The push to grant women the right to vote had been circulating around America for many years, starting in the late 1800s. Some considered politics to be a dirty business and that wholesome women should stay out of it. Well, that ridiculous argument finally came to an end in 1920 with the passage of the 19th Amendment just way too late in our nation's history. Now, let's introduce you to a word that you need to know for your exam, and that is suffrage. Suffrage means the right to vote. It's kind of an odd sounding word. It almost makes it sound like a bad thing. Maybe it should be awesomeage. Suffrage is the right to vote, and women who push for the right to vote were known as suffragettes. So remember, the 19th Amendment gave women the right to vote. Now, we spoke before of those racist policies enacted in the South to deny African Americans the right to vote. And one of those was poll taxes. Poll taxes were a tax that people had to pay in order to vote. And if you were struggling to get by financially, well, then you couldn't afford to vote. The 24th Amendment ended all of that. This denied not just African Americans, but poor people everywhere the right to vote. We see this Dr. Seuss cartoon on poll taxes, which says 10 million Americans who haven't got the price to vote. This amendment enacted in 1964 was part of the greater civil rights movement. And if you've seen the movie Selma, well, you know, there were other tactics used to deny the right to vote besides just poll taxes, but poll taxes were a big one. And we'll look at how they got rid of those, but just for your test to remember, the 24th Amendment outlawed poll taxes. So the push to end discriminatory tactics to deny voting to minorities culminated with the passage of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Now this isn't an amendment, but there's still a good chance it'll end up on your exam. Here we see Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. with President Johnson signing this important law, and this prohibited any voting discrimination. It finally enforced the 14th Amendment, which said that state laws must provide equality under the law, and the 15th Amendment, which said that voting cannot be denied based on race or color. It got rid of literacy tests and other tactics used and finally made voting a right for all Americans. Now our last voting amendment you need to know is the 26th amendment and this lowered the voting age from 21 to 18. Now this amendment was especially important as it was passed in 1971 right in the heat of the Vietnam War. A war in which 600,000 18 to 21 year old men were drafted to fight in a war that was imposed on them by a government that they weren't even allowed to vote for. The rallying cry, quote, old enough to fight, old enough to vote, demonstrated the need to lower the voting age from 21 to 18. Okay, so up next, we will be looking at the three branches again, but first, let's review which amendment defines citizenship. This was my favorite. This is a big one. It's the only real big one of these. This is the 14th Amendment, defines who a citizen is. Which amendment gave women the right to vote? I like to think of this as the voting age is 18, but for women, they had to wait so long, it's 19. Yeah, it doesn't really make sense, but some of my students said it helped them remember it. Which amendment gave African American men the right to vote? Part of the Civil War Amendments, 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment gave African American the right to vote. Which amendment said that state laws must be constitutional? Again, that's my favorite. That's the 14th Amendment. Which amendment ended slavery? Lucky number... 
13. Lucky if you were a slave, of course. Which amendment lowered the voting age to 18? That was one of the last ones that we have. It's the 26. Remember, I was alive during the Vietnam War, so that shows how recent it was, although maybe not that recent. Which amendment outlawed poll taxes? That was towards the end too. That was also in the 60s. That was the 24th amendment. Which amendment said that there must be equal protection under the law? Again, that's my favorite. Yes, there's a lot of substance in that amendment. That is the 14th amendment. Okay, and that's it. You got to know all of those amendments. I want to thank you guys for watching. We're going to be going back to the three branches of government. So be sure to subscribe. Just a reminder, teachers, that this PowerPoint with a variety of lesson plans and activities are available at Teachers Pay Teachers. Just check out Mr. Raymond Civic CSC Academy, only a buck ninety nine. Thanks for watching, guys. Be sure to subscribe, and if you keep up this good work, you're gonna ace that exam.